Sarah Cotton's kitchen can be a busy place, but one part that doesn't get much attention, the faucet. They don't even give the tap water to the dog. Just normal things like brushing your teeth or trying to make food or even give water to your pets. Everything is from bottled water. We first met Sarah and her son Casimir last year at the height of the crisis. That's it, that's it. We were along when she had him tested for lead exposure and the news wasn't good. Did I miss home while I was there? I sure did. His test came back showing high levels of lead in his system from drinking untreated water. But because lead only stays in the system for three months, and they had been drinking it for almost a year, it wasn't clear from the test how much had seeped into his body. I get really emotional about it because I have no idea the effects it will have. Um, he could have cognitive problems and behavioral problems when he gets older, and I won't know for sure if the lead is why. Her story, sadly, is by no means unique. Not in Flint, where an estimated 5,000 children were affected by tainted water. It began in spring 2014, when Flint switched its water supply from Detroit system to the Flint River to save money. The city didn't properly treat the more corrosive river water, causing lead from the aging pipes to leach into the system. Residents immediately began reporting discolored, foul-smelling water, rashes, and reactions. But nothing was immediately done. State and local agencies blamed each other for what was revealed to be nearly 18 months of inaction. Last winter, it blew up into a national crisis. Breaking news tonight. It's a disaster. The public health crisis. The toxic water in Flint, Michigan. The president today declaring a state of emergency. Since then, more than a dozen officials have been criminally charged, and the investigation continues. Residents have also launched a $720 million lawsuit. Dealing with the fallout has transformed daily life here. This is no ordinary preschool. The only requirement for admission is to be a child who is poisoned by lead. Lead is a neurotoxin, and the young are most vulnerable to lead exposure as their brains are still developing. Teachers here are trained to look for signs in how the kids act and learn, looking for changes in behavior, and trying to figure out if it's normal childhood development or the lead effect. I feel like the earlier you can get a child that may have been affected by the lead crisis, if they have any like symptoms as far as um, the behavior changes or it may have cognitive development issues, you guys ready? the earlier that you can catch that, the more that they will be successful in the future. And it's where Sarah Khan brings Casimir every day. She's confident it's helping. He'll come home and the way like he has new skills that I notice all the time, like problem solving skills, and like he'll put his finger up and be like, I have an idea. Make no mistake, this school's existence is a bitter testament to the powerful and long-term effects of lead poisoning. There are children here who weren't even born when the crisis was at its peak. They were exposed to lead in the womb. This is one of our four-year-old classrooms, and this is an observation window, so they can't see us out here, but we can observe uh, the interaction with the kids. Another reality? This is one giant experiment. Our motto is play. Bob Barnett is the Dean of Education at the University of Michigan, Flint. We're really on the forefront of the research because this has never happened before on this, this scale. And the scale is about to get bigger. This school is maxed out with a waiting list. That's why ground was just broken for a second school. The sad irony is not lost on Barnett. On the one hand, it's some of the greatest work that I've ever been involved with, and we're helping kids who would not otherwise have a chance at getting the kind of help. But knowing what caused this, is, it, 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 how can you help but not be angry at a, a system where the trust has been eroded? Please, I'm a Clearly, these kids don't have that anger. As we discovered, they're just really, really curious. Happily oblivious to the fact they may have been saddled with the handicap so soon out of the gate. So the young people are armed. But what about the older kids, those who do know that they have been poisoned? Kent Key knows about that. He's a researcher at Michigan State's College of Human Medicine. 
and he's been talking with teenagers and their parents. She was sharing with me that her young son, who he, know, he normally did not have issues in, in school, not even with grades, and all of a sudden his grades was dropping, his enthusiasm about school was like dwindling, and so she asked me to speak to him, and he mentioned to me, he said, well, Dr. Key, they said we're not going to be smart anyway because we drank the water. Photo Voice is a methodology that is used. Where he's come up with a proposal to help combat the sense of hopelessness he's found amongst Flint's teens and preteens. It's something he did with tobacco and kids. Give them cameras and let them document their own story, something called Photo Voice. I believe it, it will give them a sense of hope and also allow them to see that you don't have to succumb to the messaging that has been portrayed. More than a year later, normal life here still means weekly pickups of bottled water at one of the numerous distribution centers around town. It also means watching the slow progress being made on replacing the city's aging pipes. That right there is one of the lead pipes that's at the heart of the problem here. As you can see, it's not easy to rip out and replace. So far, the city has done about 800 in the last year, but they still have thousands of more homes to go, and the estimate is going to take at least another two to three years to get it all done. But as we discovered, even that might not be enough for some here. Will I, will I use my water now? I don't know. There is a lot of mistrust here, aimed at every level of government. So much so that even though recent tests show the water is now safe, many residents refuse to drink it. Adding insult to injury, their water bills kept coming. And while the state did subsidize some of it, that has now come to an end. I used to work really hard to provide a way for my family, and it's not, it's not possible right now because the water, what the water's done to, to, to me and my family. So I continue to pay for poison. In Flint, they're placing their trust in each other that the solutions to their problems will come from within. Kent Key was born and raised here. So too was Sharnice McGee. Both feel a sense of responsibility to bring hope to Flint's families. So much stuff going on within the economy itself that we just want families to know. You, you, you can trust us. You can trust us with your child. You can trust us with their education. And as long as we have that relationship together and that partnership, we'll be good. Sarah hopes that's true. And while for Kaz's sake she needs to remain optimistic, like many parents here, there's always doubt. Sometimes I wish I never moved here. Sometimes I blame myself for not realizing what was going on. For Flint residents, that nagging doubt may ebb and flow, but it will never truly go away. The only question, how heavy a burden will each child carry with them? I don't know for sure, and I'll never know for sure the rest of his life or my life, and that's one of the hardest things. They're not being honest about The answer won't come quickly. Progress here will take time, and the true lead effect won't be measured in months or years, but decades. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Flint, Michigan.